Luke 15 um, is a series of beautiful sacred stories about the lost being found. And as all of these great stories, they tell us about the character of the God whom we worship. And the character of the God whom we worship wants all of those who are scattered and far away and lost and seemingly beyond reach to be found, to be seated at the table, and to be known by name. And in Luke 15, we have no less than three wonderful stories about the lost that are found. They are all significantly different. But the first two are quite a bit different than the third. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that because I think it's important that we not lose sight of the differences between that which is lost and that which is found. So let me explain. The first two stories in Luke 15, which Anne read, are about a sheep that is lost and a woman who is looking for a coin. And then the third, which is not part of the lectionary reading for today, but I know you all know it, is the prodigal son, right? Where the father uh, has lost his younger son, yes? And then he returns and there's a party, yeah. And let me just pause for a second and, and tell you what I've said before because it bears repeating. In spite of the fact that the Bible is filled with stories that sometimes reveal uh, violence and uh, revenge and, and all sorts of things which are problematic and make our heads scratch, of all the Bible stories that I have been uh, part of, a, you know, having been delivered in church, the one Bible story that always gets people riled up and people standing at the door talking to me and saying, I don't like that story, as if to say, take that out. I don't want to hear that anymore, is the prodigal son. Yeah? How many oldest children are here today? Raise your hand. Yeah, we should all form a support group. Because we have hard time with this story. Yeah, don't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The one who went off to Vegas and dissed the parents, never did anything while we stayed and looked after our parents and bit our tongue, right? That one got a party and we didn't. Can you say, Rrr, right? But we're not going to talk about that story as a, as a focus this morning. But keep that in mind, because that story is important. Today, we're going to talk about the first two, which is about the sheep that is lost and the coin that is lost. And there's a difference between those two stories and the one about the sun. It's a big difference. One difference is that that which, uh, that the relationship between the shepherd and the sheep or between the woman and the coin is not nearly as intimate as between a father and a son. The responsibility in the latter case is pretty intense, right? So the son is lost, but really is lost to the father. And so the relationship that needs to be repaired or restored is between them. But when a sheep is lost or a coin is lost, really it bears responsibility on a much larger uh, audience. And it really, it could be the shepherd who finds the sheep, but it could be anyone. It could be another shepherd who finds the sheep. It could be anyone who finds the coin. The idea of fault also bears a difference, right? So 
In the case of the sheep who is lost, there is no fault. A sheep wanders. Is that because a sheep is bad? No. That's what sheep do. How can you fault the sheep for being lost, right? And the coin. There is no agency in a coin. A coin is lost, period, right? However, in the third story, the son has made some mistakes. Can we agree on that? Yes. And therefore, the word sin and the word forgiveness enters into the third story, but not the first two. And that's important. Because seeking the lost is not always a matter of seeking that which there has been a break. That there has been something emotional that has transpired, that has broken a relationship that has to be restored, and a sorting out of who did what to whom. You know what I'm saying? The third story has all of that. But the first two stories are not about any wrongdoing or restoration or some sort of... It, the, third, the first two stories are about something is lost and needs to be found, period. And it's up to anyone to find. That came very clear to me. I'm going to share a story with you where that that the nature of the first two of these stories, which is different than the third, came to me. I remember when I was in Toronto, working in a church, there was a particular funeral home that used to call on me to do funerals. And it was usually funerals where the person who died was on income assistance. And therefore, uh, it was the city that paid for the funeral. And therefore, the compensation for the minister was significantly less. And therefore, the number of ministers who would do the funeral were fewer. Shouldn't make sense, but it does. And so I used to do all these funerals. And one particular man had died, and he had no connection whatsoever to any immediate family. The funeral director could not find anybody in this man's family who wanted to participate or be involved in the funeral. None. However, when it was announced that he had died, this gentleman, there were people who showed up at the funeral home to say, he is my friend. And if you want to know about him, let me know. Uh, let me know. So the funeral director called me one day and he said, you're going to do the funeral. You don't have to visit with these people, but if you want to, here is their number. So I called them, and we met at a coffee shop. And we talked. And as we had conversation, these folk said to me that they had gone to various places in downtown Toronto and always seen this man alone. They had no history with this man. They didn't know this man. They had no judgment about this man. They just saw that he was alone. And so they took initiative. And they sought him out. And they invited him to coffee. And then they invited him to some of their social gatherings. And they invited him to things like Thanksgiving meal. And they found a place where he could feel like he belonged. And they became his family. And they were the ones who, with me, planned his funeral. And why do I share that story? Because there was absolutely no emotional break between them and this man that had to be repaired. There was no responsibility as a family member on them to seek out him who was lost. The only thing they had in common is that they were human. And yet, and they referenced this to me, they said, you know, we are children of God. He is a child of God. We family. And they took the initiative to seek out that 
which was lost so that he could feel found. It's important. I mentioned earlier in the service that I did a wedding on Thursday. I did it out at Ocean Stone. It was a, a, a beautiful day. They didn't expect it to be a beautiful day, but it turned out pretty good. Yeah. And um, as per usual, the reading that was selected by the family was 1 Corinthians 13. You know that one? Yes. I always get a kick out of families when I meet with them about a wedding, and they say to me, so we've been looking at the readings, and um, we've chosen 1 Corinthians 13. And I say, yes. And they said, have you used that before? <laughs> yes. The other reading that I always read, I always read, because they would never pick it, is Luke 14. I read it at every single wedding. And I do the same thing at every wedding. And Sean will back me up because he's usually with me, although he wasn't with me on Thursday. And, and there we are, and I'm standing in front of the couple, right? And I've got the parents here, right? Here, right? And I, I read Luke 14, which is, in essence is about when you have a party, when you have a party, Jesus is talking to the host of a gathering. Jesus is talking to the host. And Jesus says, when you have a party, when you have a party, and people don't show up to the party, you go out into the streets and find people who never get invited anywhere and you invite them in to sit in those seats. Right? So I read that. And I don't know if anyone's ever paying attention because they're more or less taking pictures. So while they're taking pictures of everything, and I'm saying these words, because people don't pay any attention to the minister, I then turn and I say to the bride and the groom, or the bride and the bride, or the groom and the groom and the parents, and I say, hey, is there anyone who's not, who sent their regrets to your wedding? And there's incredible silence and awkwardness. Wait, this was not in the rehearsal. What's he doing? I, I don't know what to say. What's the right answer? Is this, what is this, what, what's he doing? And then there's slowly a, yes. There's a couple of people who aren't coming. Yeah, a couple people. I say, aha, well, we know what we can do. We can go out to the streets, right? Although in Peggy's Cove, I don't know, I don't know. But anyway, I said, and I did this at the wedding, right? And all of a sudden, people were paying attention. Why is that important? Well, Luke 14 is just before Luke 15. So the story about going out and inviting people who are lost because no one invites them anywhere to your table is very similar, is it not, to the idea that something or someone is lost and needs to be found. It all comes together. It's all part of a sequence. And it's very important, the commentators that I read this week on this text focused specifically on two words that begin with F. Find and forgive. Forgive is a kind of way to think about something has gone wrong. The reason the one who's not there should be there is they have to confess what they did, be forgiven, and restored to their place. Right? But the story of the one who gets invited from the street, the story of the sheep, the story of the coin, has nothing to do with forgiveness. Or it just doesn't. It's only about Finding someone who is lost, period. And so, the question is, who is lost? And are we paying attention? Are we paying attention? We tend to, as a society, regard responsibility for those who are lost landing entirely with family. 
not our responsibility. If someone looks lost, why isn't their family doing more to help them? And so the idea that we might reach ourselves to that person and invite them can be a bit of a stretch. And yet, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, this is part of our discipleship. That seat at your table when you have a party or a gathering beyond your family, when you have a gathering and there's seats around and there's an empty seat because someone didn't come, there's someone who could sit there who you might invite, someone you've noticed at work or at your volunteer responsibility or at church or somewhere, somebody you've noticed is often by themselves. Yeah? I have permission to share a story with you that happened this week in a conversation. Yeah? Little lost and found story. I was breaking bread with Gloria I think she came this morning to hear what I was going to say about her. And we were breaking bread together. And as we were chatting, Gloria shared with me a story. I remember that when her husband Tim died, Gloria, who is a great host, invited all the people who had been part of that gathering to come to her home for a large celebration. It was wonderful. Do you know what she did? I like this. She had the table all filled with people, and then she wouldn't let us sit with the people we, lo we already knew. So you'd sit for a while, and then she said, all right, change. And then you have to move and talk to somebody else. Isn't that great? We should do that in church. Anyway, so that's what we did all night. And then she had it catered by a catering group. A group came in and served us. You know how that works? So when the thing was all over and people were leaving and the catering group was cleaning up, one of the people who was catering sat at the piano and started to play. And he was really good. And everybody stopped and listened to him. And he was so good that the next time Gloria had a big party, she didn't hire him to be a caterer. She hired him to be the musician. How's that? And he said to her, this is my first gig. <laughs> he felt called by name. He felt like he belonged. He felt found. Okay? Time passes. Time passes. Time passes. Did you know we had a hurricane last week? Gloria lives alone. And so at the, at the apex, if you will, of the, of the storm, she has a lot of trees, by the way, right? And, and he shows up, or I, should, whoop, I gave it away. Bang, bang, bang at the door. Who is it? You would have guessed it. You're all smart, right? It was him. What are you doing here, says Gloria. I came to see if you are right. I came to check in on you. I know you live alone. Wanted to make sure you're all right. Are you okay? All alone in a big house. Husband passed away a few years ago. Brother just died. Feels pretty good. Someone, someone, someone. Someone is looking out for me. Someone knows my name. In the midst of this storm, somebody is thinking about me. And I share that with you because we can get locked into, all of us, the idea that we are the ones who search. We got life by the tail. We're, everything is good for us. It's all good. It's all good. It's those lost people out there what are we going to do to get them in here, right? Or, or, some people have the opposite thing. When's someone going to find me? And I run into folk like that too, right? Right? They'll go to an event, they'll stand all by themselves in a corner, wait five minutes and leave, and say, nobody ever talked to me. 
right? And whether you are the one who is lost or the one who does the searching, there is on you some responsibility to make the effort, right? And all of us, no matter how together we seem to appear, at points in our life, all of us are the ones who need to be found. All of us. And so at various times in our life, we are the ones searching and we are the ones being found. And I pray in this church that as you come here and experience worship and community, that you would feel empowered to search and, and when found, to rejoice. Because to God, you matter, and to us, you matter, and you are known by name. Amen.